Yeah. Uh, we're going to continue section 2.2. Oh, I, we also have homework for 2.1. Yeah. So you can, you guys can pass it up. Um, we're going to And again, just want to make sure everyone's aware that the review for the first test is online already on the website. Uh, there's a review guide, and then there's the solutions. Which I wanted you guys to really try before actually checking the solutions. So it's important that you kind of go through the review in the, the way I said it. Um, so study the topics first, because when you actually do that review that I have posted, I want you to take it as if it were an actual test. Right, so you can actually, um, it's good for you to do it as an actual test because one, when you put yourself under time pressure, you tend to make mistakes that you wouldn't normally make if you gave yourself forever to do something. And we will be having a time pressure in the exam. So in our class, I'm, I'm going to write the exam to last for 15 minutes. Um, and the one in the review is for an hour and 15, but you can kind of take the same principle and, and work on it. Our final exam would be a lot longer. Our final exam is going to be like two hours long. So it's good for you to get used to being on a math test for a longer period of time anyway. Um, but one, it's good for you to put yourself under the pressure. You'll notice that there are certain mistakes and patterns that you'll have when you're trying to rush through something that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, it's also important that you try it yourself before looking at the solutions because hindsight is 2020, And when you read the solution to something, the answer might seem obvious to you. And you will think to yourself, oh yeah, I could have done that. But when you are the one who had to come up with it in the first place, it's a completely different situation as opposed to, oh yeah, I see the answer and that makes completely sense. And so if you look at the solutions before attempting it on your own and you're just reading through the solutions, it will kind of trick you into thinking you know more than you actually do in a weird way. So it's important that you actually attempt it before doing that. So make sure you try to study as if it were a test. Take the review as if it were a test, and don't look at the solutions until after you do this. And then afterwards, you can pretty much accurately judge what you know from what you don't know, as well as what you're shaky on, what you kind of know from what you don't know. So as, as it's written the test on the test, like on average, you should be spending around 15 minutes <coughs> on a problem. So if you realize, OK, I'm spending like 20 minutes on problem one, it means that you're kind of shaky on the topics that were in problem one, you know what I mean? So the time will also tell you kind of what you're shaky on versus what you're not shaky on. So it's important to time yourself, take it as if it were a test, and don't look at the solutions before you actually do this, okay? Just so you are you know what you don't know, and that will help you so that when you go to the tutoring center or you're studying with your friends, you know exactly what information you need to get from the person who you're working with. Um, so that's important. Uh, and so our test is on Tuesday, as I mentioned, and again, I have office hours on Monday, so you guys can see me on Monday if you, have, if you still have more questions. So over the weekend, definitely go over everything. Um, when you find what your weak spots are, try to fortify those over the weekend so that by Monday, you can just come and you know exactly, Javon, this is what I need help with, and we can fix that. So that by Tuesday, you're good. So my office hours are um, 11.30 to, I think, like 3 or 3.30 on Monday or something like that. But I'll probably be around a lot earlier anyway, so I'll probably be around maybe from 9.30, 10 o'clock, just hanging around, so you can even see me earlier if you want. But officially, I'll be there 11.30 or 3, and you can see me and talk about the review. Um, also, I would kind of resist the temptation to study by going over all your homework and all your notes and all that stuff. It's not very efficient time-wise. I mean, if you if you put in the work and really carefully did your homework the first time around, you've already kind of gotten that well-rounded benefit. Right now, you kind of like focus in on the specific skills that I'm going to be testing you for. So really use that review as a guide. If you did something in the homework, but you don't really see that topic represented on the review, I essentially just like not worry about studying that and don't really waste time on doing it. So I'm, I'm making sure that you guys know specific things that will be important in the future. So it is important that you know how to factor stuff, that you know how to graph things, that you know how to find a domain, and that you know how to turn certain word problems into certain kinds of functions. 
and things like that. But outside of that, it's good to have a total well-rounded knowledge, but for the most part, what I'm testing you on, it's going to be on the kind of things that are on the review. So use that as a guide so you don't end up wasting time spending hours studying something you don't need to study. Um, so yeah, so that's that. And now we're going to do, we're going to continue 2.2. We won't finish it. Like I said, 2.2 is actually a long section, but there are a lot of important tidbits in this section. Um, so we spoke about limits, just, just a recap of the important things that we care about limits. The, the ideas that we really want to take away that I want always hovering in your mind is that when you see this expression like limit as x approaches a of f of x equals, right? You need to know what you're searching for. What is the answer to something that looks like this? And what was the answer? <laughs> what are you looking for when you're searching for a limit? You're looking for the y value in a special context, right? So the answer to such an expression is going to be the y value f approaches as x approaches a. So there are two things that are important. You need to know that you're looking for the y value, that's what you're searching for, but you're looking for a y value in a certain context where you don't actually have to be at the point of interest. You want to know what's happening as you approach the point of interest, as you're getting close, arbitrarily close. And that's what the limit is about. So that was kind of the basic idea. And so everything we talked about limits at that point was precisely to determine this fact. How do you determine what the y value should be when you're approaching a certain, when your x value is approaching a certain point? Right? And we went over a couple approaches. Well, I'll probably go over those, but I we kind of ended class, I believe, looking at something like x approaches 0, 1 over x. I think I just mentioned this quickly and then we ran away. Um, let's actually slow this down a bit and consider some examples of this type. Let's go x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x. And look at x approaches 0 from the left of 1 over x. And look at x approaches 0 of 1 over x. Look at x approaches 0 of 1 over x squared. Let's think carefully through these again so we can sort of see certain principles happen. So if you're approaching something like A, how do you think you approach it? Ideas. <coughs> Graphing would be a nice thing to do. Like, we know what the graph of 1 over x looks like, at least you're supposed to. I think I asked that on maybe at least two quizzes by now. So you know that the graph looks like that. Now remember what the goal is. You want to know what the y value is doing. And the graph does tell you what the y value is doing. So here's 0. You're approaching it from the right side. Notice as your x values are inching closer and closer to 0, the corresponding y values are actually getting larger and larger and larger. Notice that the y values are going up, right? And they're kind of going up without bound. So in that case, you would kind of realize that, you know what, this should be positive infinity. As I'm approaching 0, my y values are shooting up and getting larger and larger without bound. So you could actually do a graph. You also have the option of doing a table of values, right? So you could have said plug in some x values and then look at the output 1 over x when you're plugging these values. And you know that you can actually plug in 0, so that's going to be a blank on the table. But you kind of plug in numbers that are getting closer and closer to 0, successively speaking. So you plug in maybe 1 over 10, 1 over 100, 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million, or whatever, right? So you can kind of see, if I plug in x equals 1 over 10, then 1 over x will be actually 10. For this one, x will be 100. Here, x will be 1,000. Here, x will be a million. Right? So you can see what are hap what's happening to these y values. They're getting larger and larger and larger and larger. There seems to be no end in sight. 
clearly the bigger I make the denominator, the larger the output is going to be over here. So you can see things just keep getting bigger. It's going off to infinity, right? Just by watching the table of values. And in this case, um, the graph would be the recommended root. Um, finding a table of values is kind of annoying in general. I mean, it's completely doable, and you, and you will have calculators on your exam. And if push comes to shove and you blank out on every other thing, you always have this option available to you. But it's, it's probably not the, the most efficient way to do it. A lot of times, just knowing the graphs very well, you can get to the answer. Um, so you have that option. What about B? Well, actually, the same function, essentially. So you're really going to look at this from the other side. So if I have limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side of 1 over x, again, I think of this graph. I realize as I'm approaching from the negative side, my y values keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. They're getting larger in magnitude, but they're going towards the negative side. So this would be negative infinity is what I mean. Just by knowing the graph. As I move to closer to 0 from the left side, my y values keep going down and down and down. They're going down to negative infinity. So what can you say the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x is? No. Oh, I mean, for, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't exist. You'd write d and e. Why would you write d and e? Yeah? Is it because from both the right and the left, they're not equal? The right and the left do not agree. Now, technically, infinity is not a number, but we're after this, we're trying to track the behavior of the y value. So in terms of behaviors, infinity does tell you a lot. It tells you that it's just shooting up or shooting down. But the kinds of infinities that we're approaching don't agree. One is infinity in one direction, the other is infinity in the other direction, and they're, they're really diverging. The y values are really doing something very different. And so based on the fact that the left and right don't agree, The overall limit doesn't exist. So in this case, the one side limits exist. It's kind of a stretch for the word, because infinity usually is not considered a number. But for our, our, our purposes, we will say these exist, because the behavior gives us, infinity gives us a lot of important information about the behavior. But the fact that the, coming from the right side and coming from the left side, they don't agree, um, we will say the overall the limit does not exist. What about this guy here, the last guy? So what do you think the answer is based on that picture? Um, the limits will be the same. The limits are the same. In fact, they're both infinite and they're both positive infinity. So what would you say the overall limit is? Positive infinity. You describe this as positive infinity. Whether we're coming from the right or the left of zero, the graph is the y values are doing the same thing. They're going up. So if I'm approaching zero from the right side, my y value is approaching infinity. If I approach zero from the left side, my y value is also approaching infinity. These two agree as far as I'm concerned. They're both the same sign of infinity. So I can say that is the answer. So let's do a recap of some of the examples here and some of the strategies that we've seen so far, which I'm, I'm going to kind of make this a little bit more precise. Uh, presently, but let's look at it. So the first example I, I, I gave us was uh, x approaches 1 of x plus 1. And the second example, I believe, was x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. I did a, another example of a piecewise function, I think. But 
then I kind of started talking about these guys. So we looked at something like this. And one, I want you to appreciate that different strategies worked here. So the first one, these, essentially the strategy that we used, because this was a very nice function, we could draw the picture and we could see, oh yeah, as soon as the x is getting close to this, the y is getting close to that. Here we could kind of just figure out the answer by plugging in x equals 1. Right? So that one was pretty straightforward. We realized that the answer is 2. This wasn't as straightforward. right? What we did here was we ended up trying to simplify it. This canceled because as long as x is not at 1, um, it's just a regular fraction. And so now we can figure out that that answer was also 2. So the strategy we used here was we simplified, then plugged in x equals 1. That's what we did last time. Here what we did was we looked at the graph, or we looked at a table of values. Now one thing I want you to appreciate is that we almost didn't have a choice here. This one was nice, we could plug in values, but here I couldn't immediately plug in a value, so I couldn't use the same strategy here as here. Um, but I could simplify first and then I could plug in a number. If you look at this one though, there, there was that, this one was particularly strange because one, I couldn't plug in x equals zero, and two, I actually can't simplify it so I can plug in x equals zero. So I can't plug in, I can't simplify it, and so I couldn't really have any of these options available to me. I had to come up with something else. What I decided to come up with was the graph. And just by looking at the graph and watching how this function behaves on the graph, I could figure out what the limit is going to behave like, because the limit is just the y value. So that just brings us to the first three strategies when approaching limits. So normally when I'm giving you a limit problem to do on an exam or a quiz or whatever, and a lot of times you'll see it in the homework, the problem is not going to say, here's the limit and here's the approach you should take. No, it's just going to say, compute this limit. And you have to figure out the approach. And especially if you're, this is the first time you're seeing limits, that might be daunting. So I'll, I'll give you some concrete footing here of how you're going to want to approach these guys. So let's talk about strategies for approaching limit problems. And I essentially did the examples in the order of the easiest strategy towards the harder strategies. So um, that was no coincidence. So this is like to compute the limit as x approaches f of x. First thing you're going to do, so you're faced with a random limit on a test or a quiz. The very first thing you'll always try to do is to see if you're in the easiest case and try to plug in. Try to actually plug in x equals a, right? If this can work, the output is your limit. Right, so this is the strategy that worked on this one. It was the easiest case. It was just x plus 1. There was no problem in actually plugging in x equals 1. So I just plugged in x equals 1, and that was my answer. Right. So try to plug in x equals 8. If this works, then that's your answer. You don't have to do anything else. You just compute the value. If not, then you try the second option. Now, if you're faced with a limit, you try to plug in, but you can't plug in the value. What you're going to do is try to simplify so that you can plug in the value. And that's kind of what we ended up having to do here. So if I was given this problem, forget everything else that happened, and I was just given this on a test, I'll realize here it's approaching x equals 1, so I'll try to, oh, can I plug in x equals 1? I'd immediately see that I can't do that because I have to divide by 0. So now my second thing is, could I simplify this expression to be able to plug in 1? Turns out I could actually do that, and now when I plug in 1, the answer was 2, and that was actually the answer. Right? So that's step 2 when faced with a limit problem. If 
you can, the output is your limit. Or the limit. If not, there's a, the other option. Right? It kind of goes in this order. So the third thing you'll do, if, if the if plug-in didn't work and you can't simplify the plug-in, um, you'll consider the graph or a table of values. And then the behavior of the graph and this may tell you how the y value behaves. Which is the whole point in finding the limit anyways, to figure out the y value or tracking the y value. So that's the strategy I ended up having to do here. So if I was given this guy on a test, I first try to plug in. I can't plug in x equals 0. I divide by 0. So the second thing I try to do is to simplify if I can plug in. But this is just 1. The bottom is x. There's no way to simplify that and cancel the x in the bottom. So I moved on to the third option. I considered what does it look like? What is the graph? Right? And that immediately I could just, from the picture in my head, I could tell what the answer is. There's a fourth option. And I guess four star, maybe it's a continuation of the third option, because this it would kind of branch out <coughs> depending on what you are. Because sometimes even knowing what the graph looks like is annoying. And in this case, what you can do is, if you don't know the graph, or you don't want to draw the graph because the function itself is just too complicated. Um, in this case, you can use your knowledge. is a bit vague, so I'll, I'll give you some specific instances of applying that rule. There really are a lot of cases here, and, and there are many calculus classes that go into this in more depth, but for our class, there, there, there are relatively a few scenarios that we have to cover. So one application of 4L, I'll give you a couple applications. If you can apply this idea to limits at infinity. All right, so limit as infinity, as you might recall, is when your x is approaching infinity or negative infinity. As x is going to infinity or negative infinity, but infinity is how you want to think about it at first. Um, following We looked at several kinds of functions so far. We looked at log functions. We also looked at polynomials. So let's say our a here is bigger than 1, just to make things um, clear. Now, as x is going off to infinity, how does this function compare to that function? Would be a question that you would want to know. Um, it's not something I'm going to prove for you guys. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Because in, actually, to prove this, you probably would need the precise definition of a limit, and I only gave you the fuzzy definition. But the answer is the following. A polynomial, this here, is like a less than sign. But I, I wanted you to read it as a lot less. Right? This is a lot less than 
okay? In other words, as your x is going off to infinity, compared to a polynomial, a log function would be very small, okay? It will be so small, in fact, compared to a polynomial, a log function would be almost like nothing. You might as well be zero. That's, that's what I'm talking about, okay? So polynomials are bigger than logarithms as you're going off to infinity, right? There will be eventually a point in space where the polynomial graph is way up here and the log graph is way down here, right? Compared to a log graph, a polynomial graph will be much bigger. Its y value will be much higher, right? There's also, we also looked at exponential function. It turns out exponentials are much bigger than polynomials in general. So an exponential function is always going to be much bigger than a polynomial. If you go off to infinity far enough, there'll come a point, or they'll come after a certain point, the graph of this guy will be so far above the graph of this guy, it's like that guy might not even be trying. He, should, he might as well be zero. Right? Because relative to this guy, he'll be super close to the x-axis. I mean, there are other functions here, like x factorial or x raised to the x power, but we're not going to worry about guys like those. The relationship of these three functions are going to be important to us. Right? So we talked about logs, we talked about polynomials, we talked about exponentials. And as we're going off into infinity, they share this relationship. Exponentials will always overwhelm polynomials. Polynomials will always overwhelm logarithms. So you can use that strategy, well, you can use that knowledge to figure out the strategy for solving a limit like this. So let's say you have this limit. The limit as x approaches infinity of x to the 10 divided by e to the x. Right? So you're given that limit on test or quiz or in a homework or something else. Right? And so you might initially try to do strategy one, but what does it mean to plug in infinity anyway? You can't really get any meaningful answer from that. I'm sure you get infinity over infinity, but that's not actually a determinant form, because infinity over infinity can literally be anything. Um, so plugging in won't work. Can you simplify the plug-in? That won't work either. Right, what are you going to simplify? What are you going to cancel? One's an exponential, one's a polynomial. You can't cancel x's, you can't do anything. So you can't simplify as well. So you might go on to your third option. What about the graph? And the graph of this is really hard to figure out, right? Especially by hand. Um, there's a process where you can do it that we'll learn more about, but it's going to be annoying. It's not going to be worth going through that hassle to solve this problem. But Understanding the relationship between these two and understanding how this guy relates to that guy is what's going to help me here. I know that as my x is going to infinity, this guy is very small compared to this guy. So in other words, when I look at this, what I'm going to see is that there's going to be a small number divided by a huge number. Right? So that's what I'm seeing when I look at this limit. And if you have a fraction where the numerator is small and the denominator is large, what is the fraction going towards? Going towards zero. So I can say the limit of this is zero. Without really doing much, um, it's just me realizing, oh, there's a polynomial and an exponential. We're going to infinity. The exponential will win. So this means the denominator is huge compared to the numerator. And so the limit is going to be zero. And that's something you can see for yourself. You can think, compare all these guys. Notice that as you make the denominator larger, the overall number gets smaller and smaller. It decreases. Right? So as you start to make the denominator bigger, the overall fraction is smaller. Right? So this here is like 0.1, but this is like 0 0.01. By the time you get here, it's 0 0.000001. You know, the, the number is getting smaller when the denominator gets bigger. So a fraction where the numerator is very small and the denominator is huge compared to it, that fraction is going to zero. So I can actually use this relationship to determine what a limit is, right? Based on how the y values are. Um, any questions on that? 
Of course, the, the in the in this case, the, the reciprocal would be true. If I'm doing this and the exponential is on top and the polynomial is on the bottom, then I realize that this is going to a huge number, so it's a fraction where the top is big and the bottom is small. That's going to give me a huge positive number, so this is going towards infinity. Right, so I realize that this limit is actually going to infinity, that limit is actually going to zero. Right? And, and just knowing the relationship between these functions, how they compare when their x gets <coughs> huge, is going to help us figure that out. about another case, another application of this idea. So let's say n is bigger than 1, then x to the n is going to be much smaller than x to the m if m is bigger than n and your x is going off to infinity. In other words, when you're comparing two polynomials to each other, then the one with the higher power will win if you're going off to infinity. Right? And this one will be so huge after a point that that guy might as well not try. Right? It might as well be zero, it might as well be nothing. So this means, for example, and we'll look at slightly more complicated cases here. This means, for example, if I take the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared divided by x cubed, that's going to be 0, because as far as I'm concerned, the denominator is huge compared to the numerator, because the power here is bigger than the power there. So I can use that relationship. Whereas the inverse, if I look at x goes to infinity of x cubed over x squared, then that's going to be infinity. Now, of course, here you could simplify and kind of see that, but also knowing how polynomials relate to each other is going to be important. Um, it's going to be important for the next thing that I'm going to talk about. So there are problems like this on, on the bonus to the review. So what we're going to look at now is um, limits at infinity of rational functions. So remember, a rational function is a ratio of polynomials. I'm going to give you a general rule, but let's, let's play around this a little bit. Let's illustrate examples of the cases that can happen here. Um, the strategy is to always divide the top and the bottom power of x in the denominator. So it turns out based on this strategy, uh, we, we will be able to come up with a general rule at the end, but I want to show you why that rule is, makes sense. Even though strictly speaking, I'm not going to prove it to you, just so you have an intuitive idea of why it might make sense in a strictly mathematical kind of reasoning. Let's look at this example. So first I'm going to do an example where we have a rational function and the denominator has a higher power than the numerator. So let's say I have 2x cubed plus 4 squared minus 7 over 5x to the fifth minus 2x. 
you're given that problem. There are a couple ways we can think about this. Um, one we could remember that last rule I gave you is, is that in the top, in terms of this guy, in terms of these two, this guy's a lot bigger, and that guy almost doesn't matter. And the same will be true for the bottom. So essentially, you can get, you can ignore all the lower powers. Is one way you can look at it. But let's let's actually apply this strategy so you can see another way to look at it. So what you would do is you'd identify the highest power, the denominator, which is x to the fifth. You're going to divide each term in the numerator and denominator by x to the fifth. There is a property of limits that I'll tell you guys about afterwards, where if you want to take the limit of a division, you could actually split the limit up across the division. And so we can actually look at the top separately from the bottom. So let's look at what's happening in the top. What about 2 over x squared? What is that happening? What is happening to that? It's, it's huge. It's getting smaller. It's getting smaller. In fact, it's approaching 0. Right? Me knowing the graph of 1 over x squared would tell me that. Similar thing would happen here. Similar thing would happen here. So each term in the numerator will go to 0. This guy will go to 5, this guy will go to 0, this guy will go to 0 as x is getting large. So overall, the answers end up going to be 0 divided by 5, which is 0. And in fact, this is, this is always going to be the case, actually. Whenever you're having a limit at infinity of a ratio of polynomials and the denominator is, the larger, is largest in the denominator has the largest power of x, the answer it ends up being will always go to 0 because essentially the denominator is overwhelming the numerator because the, it has the higher power of x. So you have a fraction where the denominator is huge and the top is relatively small. So that's one scenario we can find ourselves in. Let's look at another scenario. x goes to infinity. But here I'm going to do 3 plus 2x cubed minus 7x to the fourth for 2 plus 3x minus 2x squared. Let's do a cubed. I wanted to illustrate something. So you might be given that kind of little problem. So I'll give you the shortcut in a bit. Um, you could essentially ignore the lower powers again, but let's actually run with this strategy because it's a, the proof of the rule I, I give you is, is kind of derived this way. Identify the largest power in the denominator. You're going to divide everyone by that power of x. So 3 divided by x cubed plus 2x cubed over x cubed minus 7x to the fourth over x cubed, 2 over x cubed, 3x over x cubed, 2x cubed over x cubed. You can simplify this. Put the limit up, apply it to the top and the bottom. This guy will go to 0, that guy will go to 2, 
this guy will go to zero, this guy will go to zero, this guy will go to two. So I have end up with the limit of two minus seven x divided by two. And my x is going to infinity. What is the answer going to be? Not quite. So my denominator is staying as 2, but my x is becoming huge, so the numerator is becoming huge. But there's a negative sign here, which you have to pay attention to. So it's a huge number, but it's a negative huge number. And so it goes to negative infinity. And it turns out something that that will always be the case. If you're taking a ratio of polynomials, and the, the highest power in the numerator is larger than the highest power in the denominator, the answer will always be infinite. The difference is, it might be plus or minus infinity, depending on the signs and the powers of the x's and all that stuff. So you, you have to pay attention to the signs in this case. But you can know ahead of time that the answer is going to be an infinite answer. Positive or negative, depending on the signs of the things you're looking for. Um, notice, you can also notice here that if I were approaching negative infinity instead of positive infinity, then here I would get a negative times a negative and the answer would have been positive, right? It would have changed the sign. But a similar behavior to this will always happen if the top has the highest power. Let's look at another case. What if the powers are the same in the top and the bottom? given that limit on an exam, what do you do? Let's follow the same strategy. And I'll give you a quick array later. When you find the highest power of x in the denominator, this is x to the 6, you're going to divide each term in the, in the fraction by x to the 6. It comes 2 over x to the 6 plus 3x squared over x to the 6 minus 3x to the 6 over x to the 6. Four x to the six over x to the six. Two x over x to the six minus seven over x to the six. We can simplify this. This would be two over x to the six. Be three over x to the fourth. That's just three. This would just be four. This would be two over x to the fifth. This would be seven over x to the six. Using our knowledge of 1 over x to the power as x goes to infinity, we know that these all go to 0. This goes to 0. And so this really, what's left over is just the minus 3 and the 4. So the answer here would be minus 3 and the 4. And that would be the answer here. One thing I want you to notice about that number Notice that if you look at the highest powers in the top and bottom, you just took their leading coefficients and you divided them. So it was the ratio of the leading coefficients. Right? There's a minus 3 in front of the x to the 6 here. There's a positive 4 in front of the x to the 6 here. The answer ends up being minus 3 over 4. Right? And that's because the highest power in the top and the bottom were actually the same. So we can actually talk about a general theory. Or a general rule for things like this. So that P, Q are polynomials. Then the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity kind of will work for both of P of x divided by Q of x is equal to, there are one of three cases. There's the first case that we did, which is the answer is 0. 
this case, you know, will happen if the degree of Q is bigger than the degree of P. If it, you might remember, degree just means the highest power, right? Highest power. So if you have a ratio of two polynomials, the highest power on the bottom is, is greater than the highest power on the top. The answer is always going to go to zero when your x is going, if it's a limit at infinity. You actually don't have to do anything. The denominator overwhelms the numerator. The answer is going to be plus or minus infinity if the, if the highest power is in the top. So that was like the second example. Um, here you have to be careful. Watch the signs. Right, so you have to worry about what power, is it an odd power, an even power, and what is the coefficient sign, and you know, you might have negative times negative giving positive. Like you have, you have these issues to worry about, but the answer is going to be some sort of infinity. So either going to be positive or negative, depending on the signs that are in the actual question. So that's the second case that these guys will have. The third case is, um, it goes to the following. The leading coefficient of p divided by the leading coefficient of q. This is called the ratio of leading coefficients. That's the terminology they would use to describe that. And this happens if the highest powers are the same in the top of and bottom. The degree of p is actually exactly equal to the degree of q. And then that will be the answer for your limit. So this is another class of limits that will, will be important for us to know. Ratios of polynomials. Let's do some examples. Now I'll tell you about properties. The goal would be to tell me the answer to these relatively quickly. Um, 
Yeah. That's a 2x cube in the second one? This? In the 2x cubed, yes. It's a cube. Okay, what do you think is the top one? <coughs> yeah? Negative infinity. Okay, what did you see to look at that? Um, well, the the, uh, the, uh, the highest, um, not the coefficient, the other term, power. The yeah. highest power was an x to the ninth in the numerator. Mm -hmm. And um, the lowest, the, the highest in the denominator was x squared. All right. So that means that. So you look at this, and you identify the biggest, fattest guys in the around. All right. So you look in the numerator, find the biggest guy. Look in the denominator, find the biggest guy, and then you compare them. Notice that the biggest guy in the top is a ninth power. The biggest guy in the bottom is a second power. The top is bigger than the bottom. So I know the answer is going to be some sort of infinity. Now I have to figure out which one of the infinities. Well, here my x is going to infinity, so that's a positive number. It's huge. So I take a huge positive number raised to the ninth power. It stays a huge positive number, and then I multiply by a negative. All right, so that's a negative sign in the top divided by, here I take a huge positive number, I square it, it stays positive, multiply by a positive number, so it's a positive number in the denominator as well. So overall, this is negative infinity is the answer here. What about this one? Yeah? You do the same process. So this is the highest power on the top. This is the highest power on the bottom. So I know it's going to be some sort of infinity. You think it's positive infinity? Yeah. Well, let's see. Did you realize that this was a negative infinity? I probably didn't write that. This is a negative infinity here. So notice here, if I plug in a negative number into here, x to the fourth, it becomes positive. So the top is going to be, give me a positive huge number. In the denominator, if I plug in a negative, I cube it, I get negative. Multiply by a positive 2, it's still negative, so that's divided by a negative. So it turns out that is, again, negative infinity. And this is what I mean about watching this, you have to be careful. Um, based on the sign of what your, the limit is approaching, also the signs of the coefficients and the powers and all that stuff, you just kind of ignore everyone except the biggest guys, but you watch the signs in that kind of relationship. What about this one? Yeah? Negative four over three. It's just going to be minus 4 over 3 is the answer. If you do that again, you watch the biggest guy. The biggest guy here is 4x to the 7. The biggest guy here is minus 3x to the 7. They happen to have the same power, which means the limit is just the ratio of the coefficients. 4 over negative 3. Just minus 4 over 3. So you can look at it and, and tell that that would be the answer. What about this one? Yeah? Zero. So again, so sure, I have a radical pi here, which might freak some people out, but it actually doesn't matter. He doesn't have an x attached to it, so he literally doesn't matter. You see, the x to the largest power in the top is x to the seventh. The largest power of x in the bottom is x to the ninth. The bottom has the highest power, which means this limit goes to zero. And the signs actually don't matter here, because positive or negative zero is still just zero. Zero doesn't really have a sign. So that's it. So you can kind of just, you can know what these limits are just by how the, knowing about the relationships between the functions. So the highest power is on top, which is, was in these two cases, it's going to be infinite. You just have to watch the signs, kind of be careful with that. The highest power on the top and bottom is the same. It just goes to the coefficients. You divide the top coefficient by the bottom coefficient. Highest power is on the bottom. The answer is always zero. You don't worry about it. So, um, and essentially, if you're doing this, because I, I do like you guys to show your works when, when show your work when you're doing a test. But with a problem like this, you don't, there's really nothing to show. I don't expect you to actually do anything. But what you can do here is tell me your reasoning for doing something like this. So what I would call guys like this where the power is higher on the top, call it top heavy. 
All right, so that would be your explanation as to why this is the answer. Oh, it's a top-heavy function. So I can know, okay, they're thinking of the right thing. Um, in this case, you can call this bottom-heavy. So just write down that phrase. The answer is zero because it's bottom-heavy. And I, I'll, just, I'll assume you know what you're talking about if you use that phrase, right? Of course, if you say top-heavy here, I'll know that you don't know what you're talking about because it, it has, it's bottom-heavy and that's why it's zero. And here you can actually just write down the phrase ratio of leading coefficients. And if you write down that phrase, I'll assume you examine the highest powers on the top and bottom, you'd realize that the powers were the same, and so you took the ratio of the leading coefficient. <coughs> right? And that's the, just writing that phrase is showing your work, as far as I'm concerned. Because with these, it, it doesn't. There's no point in making something longer than it has to be. Right, so this is a, 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 some limits that you can relatively tell the answer pretty quickly, as long as you're going to infinity. If this number is going to something other than infinity, then all bets are off. This rule doesn't work. Right? You'll have to either plug in the number or try one of the previous techniques. But when you're going to infinity, um, top heavy and bottom heavy and ratio of leading coefficients are three classes that you can find yourself in. Now, in figuring these out, we kind of apply some properties of limits that I, I never really told you guys existed. So now, just for the sake of completeness, for the most part, you don't probably don't have to think in this way, but just to be comprehensive, I'm going to tell you these rules anyway. So these are called um, the limit laws. Just some rules that you know apply to limits, so you can apply them at any time and not worry about if you're doing something illegal. It, it would be illegal to do this. It's nice to know that. Let's see me a constant. And suppose the limit as x approaches a of f of x and limit as x approaches a of g of x exists. And they're finite. The rules I'm going to give you don't necessarily work for infinite limits, but um, yeah. So let's do it. These limits actually give you an answer, and it's just a real number. It's a number. Here are some properties of limits. If you're taking a limit of a constant times a function, you can actually factor the constant out. going to be the constant times the limit of the function. So for example, just a silly example here, limit as x approaches 1 of 2x plus 2, that's actually the same as 2 times the limit of x plus 1. Right, that, that two. Right, 2 is a common factor, it's a constant, I can factor it and put it in front of the limit, and then find the limit of the, the remainder. And that's legal. I can do that, and that would actually be true. The other rule is that limit distributes across sums, right? So not true for logs, not true for many things, but it's actually true for limits. So if I want to take the limit of a sum of functions, sum or difference of functions, I can actually just take the limit of each individual function and then add the result. So I can separate a limit in terms of adding or subtracting. And I can apply a limit to each part. <coughs> a stupid example here, the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus e to the x. This is the limit of x squared plus the limit of e to the x as x is approaching 1. So this I can think of as 1 squared plus e to the 1. Of one plus one. Another thing is limits distribute across products. Which is 
it's kind of a weird rule, because um, that's not exactly following the distributive law, but it works uh, almost like a power in this case. So I can do the limit of f multiplied by the limit of g. Right, I can apply the limit to each part in the product individually. And that's, that's legal, you can do that. Um, so you can talk about <coughs> the limit as x approaches 1 of x times e to the x. And that is actually the limit of x times the limit of e to the x. Which is going to be 1 times e as x is approaching 1. And division is really just multiplication by a reciprocal, so this actually also works for divisions. Limit as x approaches a of f of x divided by g of x is the limit of the f divided by the limit of the g as x approaches a. Provided the limit of the g is not zero, of course. And we kind of used these rules in the previous case where when we had the ratio of these polynomials, I, we looked at the bottom and top separately, and we looked at each individual term separately. We were actually applying these rules in the background. The fact that I can look at each term separately was an application of this rule. The fact that I can look at the top and bottom separately and see who, what's going on in each was applying this rule. Um, another rule that you can be aware of work with limits is that they can pass through powers as well. So fifth rule that you can, if you're ever in a situation where this might help you out, it's okay to do it. So you can think about the limit of a function raised to a power. You can actually put the limit inside, just worry about the limit of the inside, and then raise the answer to the power. And this is if n is a positive number. It kind of works for negative numbers as well, but you just should just remember that if your n is negative, it will push things into the denominator, and then you have to worry about division by zero and all that stuff. But uh, in principle, it would work with uh, negative powers as well. So if I can have the limit as x approaches 1, of 2x plus 3 cubed. You don't have to multiply out or do anything crazy like that. You can simply think of this as the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x plus 3, and then cube that. As x approaches 1 of this guy, that's 5. So the answer is 5 cubed. So we'll stop there. Those are the limit laws. And you guys actually know enough at this point to cover all the bonuses in the, in the review. Maybe I'll do something further. Maybe. But yeah, the bonus for the review. I will stop there. Remember, we have a test on Tuesday. Practice the review. See me on Monday if there are any issues. And unless there are questions. Does this wrap up the section? No, we still have some more. We want, we want to talk about continuity next. Okay. As well as some other simple time techniques, we'll look at some other techniques as well.